Hello, welcome to this presentation about the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson. Um, this revision material is here just to give you an overview of the, some of the main ideas and things contained within this um, novel for your uh, GCSE English Literature Paper 1 exam. Um, it, you should really see this as kind of the starting point for your revision and you're very welcome to revisit this video as often as you like. Um, you are going to focus on the background and context of this novel. AO3 is, is the area that uh, that links to greatly and you must ensure that regularly within your writing you're thinking not just about the language analysis that you do in lessons a lot of the time, but also constantly thinking about the writer. The same thing applies to when you're looking at the poetry or the modern text or with Shakespeare. You know, you're constantly thinking about the writer if you can, constantly making reference to what you think that writer is trying to convey and, and the wider, the big ideas perhaps of the novel. We're then just going to do a very quick overview of genre. And again, that's another key area where I think the higher marks um, come from within your exam, that actually if you, you're not just talking about the novel in itself, you're talking about how it sits within the genre and, and how the writer has, has written something that fits or perhaps doesn't fit within the genre too. We'll do a very quick summary of the plot, and that literally is a very quick summary of the plot. Um, there's no getting away from the fact that you need to know this novel really well, um, and actually there's no substitute in terms of your revision for actually picking up the, the novel and reading it. The nice thing with Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is that it's relatively short, and that actually you probably can read this um, in maybe a couple of sittings as well. And I would advise that you are uh, planning between now and the time of your exam opportunities for you to pick up the novel and, and read it on a regular basis. Following this summary of the plot, we'll look at the, the main themes within this novel. And again, that's a key area for what you need to include within your uh, exam, um, making sure that you're aware not just of one moment of how that theme links to the extract in the exam, but also how it links to the novel as a whole. And then finally, we'll look at um, some exam questions that you can um, use to, to prepare um, at home. So this is Robert Louis Stevenson, um, the gentleman on the right hand side. He's a Scottish novelist and perhaps um, beyond the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, best known for the children's story, which is Treasure Island. Um, he, it is a, he's, he's known primarily as being a children's writer, and that's where he, he rose to fame. Um, he was born in the Victorian era, if you look at 1850, he died in 1894, uh, and he had a very difficult um, upbringing. He was a very sick child, and, and actually that ill health um, stayed with him all the way through his, his life, and actually... Um, part of the influence of writing Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde was a uh, part of, of um, his treatment. He had a, an, a hallucinations in his dream as a result of the drugs he was taking. And so therefore this idea of kind of um, foggy dream like kind of sequences within the novel kind of linked almost directly to his experience um, in real life. To help you with your understanding and, and wider knowledge of this, this uh, novel, I'd really recommend you, you have a look at the works of Edgar Allan Poe and Charles Dickens. Um, these two were arguably the most popular writers in the Victorian era and used their works to make comments about the society that they lived in. Uh, not only that, particularly with, with Charles Dickens, linking to that wide range of genres. Edgar Allan Poe certainly is associated with the Gothic genre, which um, Charles Dickens on occasions is too. But it's also that, that kind of linking into to different styles and, and different writing. Now, religion and science was a really important aspect of society certainly more so than, than perhaps it is today. And one of the, the most significant events that took place within the, uh, the, the 19th century was Charles Darwin's The Origin of Species, which introduced this idea of the, the theory of evolution. Now we perhaps don't, we kind of maybe take for granted about the fact of evolution. We talk quite openly and quite freely about evolution, but when it was first published, as you can see in 1859, it was a really revolutionary and controversial um, piece of, of work. Um, people genuinely thought that it was designed um, to be against to be against the word of God, to be against religion, which, which indeed it isn't. And actually, as time has gone on, um, evolution has become more integrated within religion. But certainly at the time, there was a fear amongst many within the Victorian time that um, the idea of evolution was directly at odds with it. And that's something that 
that uh, Robert Louis Stevenson would have been aware of. And actually, if you go through the novel, there's a number of references to God and how people interact with him, not least of all with Jekyll and his experience with Lanyon. And those two certainly um, have different opposing attitudes towards science. Lanyon is certainly the more traditional um, scientific uh, individual certainly would look to be integrating God within his experiments, whereas Jekyll, as it says in front of you, is seen as a maverick scientist, somebody who's going to push what science is, is capable of doing. And that idea also links to the gothic genre as well. If you think about um, other novels that were released um, around the same time as Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Frankenstein being one of them, and many of those novels um, explore what science can do. And actually pose that question about whether they should do it or not and that's maybe something to think about with this novel whether actually science um, should push our society or should we remain kind of relatively um, stable within the way we, we, we interact with science linked to this as well this idea of nature and the supernatural that as before this idea that humanity is in conflict um, within itself and that actually with this exploration of the darker side of humanity that existed and actually the Victorian era, partly through the sort of widespread use of, of reading um, and newspapers and also the glorification of crime, uh, horrendous crimes that were taking place, um, it sort of it forced the society to start to explore how um, who they really are. Um, a lot of people sort of initially felt that um, the way to success in a Victorian society, you'd be moral, you look after one another, you're, you're kind. But actually what Jekyll and Hyde and other novels and uh, expose is the fact that there is that duality of, of human nature. Um, you, you've probably heard about the Jack the Ripper murderer, the, the uh, individual who um, murdered um, a whole series of, of women in the 1880s. The key thing with Jack the Ripper is firstly he was never found and it put a fear of, of the life into many people within London. But one theory that um, still continues to this day is that the individual Jack the Ripper was somebody who was a well-respected, educated, uh, admired um, man. By day, he lived a very, very moralistic life. He was a very decent person. But by night, he transformed into Jack the Ripper and, and did these absolutely heinous crimes. And, and if you think about it, Jekyll and Hyde is about a similar kind of idea. That actually is about somebody who wants to live a very moralistic life during the day, wants the sort of applause of, of high reputation, but actually at night um, he also wants to, to do evil uh, evil things and, and um, commit acts of violence or, or sexual deviance. So, so this was a really key area of of um, thought process within the Victorian side and something that definitely when we think about the context the AO3 side of it you should be thinking about linking in as well. Now thinking about the gothic genre we, I won't spend too much time on this but as you can see in the bullet points there um, these are some not all but some of the the gothic uh, conventions that we would come to expect in, in a gothic text and actually when you look at them all they all, to a certain extent, um, are, can be found within the novel Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Clearly events, death and murders, nighttime, a lot of the events occur at nighttime, and even events that occur during the day. If you think about the incident at the window, the, uh, the light is described as being prematurely twilight. It's becoming dark early. Also, this the regular constant theme of fog. Fog is, as you can see in the picture there, you know, conceals things. It keeps things secret, which is another theme and link to the Gothic genre. We have often in Gothic stories ghosts, but certainly unusual characters, characters that are strange, characters that are possibly remind us of ourselves um, or possibly make us fear one another as well. What I said earlier about science and religion and, and the way in which people interact with it is, is, is another area of Gothic um, genre tradition that actually it's about how our society is being challenged and actually are the traditions that we live with um, within, within society, are they going to be uh, the same after the events that they explore? Now this final point is another important area where characters have desires to act in certain often sinful ways and it's about characters who this is linked back to the science and religion who want to push the traditions push the societal norms that take place and often want to live out their desires um, having been repressed or suppressed um, within their lives
Now, the crime genre is another key area to think about. Now, often we don't think about Jekyll and Hyde as a crime story, but it actually is. And in some ways, it's more of a crime story than it is gothic, although certainly I think the two go hand in hand. Some of the conventions that we would expect to see in a crime story, red herrings. Now, a red herring is um, a, a literary narrative device where the writer is deliberately misleading the reader. As you get more and more um, experience with reading texts, you know, don't always trust what the writer is telling you. Start to be critical. You know, they're wanting to guide you on a story, but that doesn't mean they're telling you the truth all the time. Another area is the antagonist. So in, in very simplest terms, it's the bad character uh, makes it personal for the protagonist. The protagonist can be seen as the good character or certainly the main character, the character we follow. And when we think about actually who the main character in Jekyll and Hyde is, it's Utterson. Utterson is our main character. It's he that we follow throughout the novel. And so you could then think, need to think about, well, who is the antagonist? The obvious example would be it's Hyde. Hyde is the antagonist. But as we find out right at the end of the novel, it's actually Jekyll. Because Jekyll and Hyde are the same person, um, Jekyll is the antagonist, although we don't think that he has been if you like, that's a red herring that Stevenson has presented Jekyll as being a decent, moral person, but actually he isn't. Which links to the third point, this idea of being a shapeshifter or a hypocrite, somebody who changes, somebody who we can't quite trust, somebody who says one thing and does another. Another element of the crime genre is the ticking clock. This idea of this clear threat to life and danger that they've got to push through. They've got to get to um, the conclusion for fear of somebody's death, usually. And that's definitely the case. If you look at the way that the final chapter, The Last Night, is described, it's, it, there's definitely a fear that Jekyll is going to have been murdered by, um, by Hyde, which is another red herring. And finally, this resolution at the end where the antagonist is brought to justice or is killed. Now, that's one thing that I would suggest you have a clear think about. Actually, there, is there a resolution at the end of this novel? Hyde certainly has, has died and Jekyll has written his statement. But I would suggest that those higher marks that should be coming for you in the exam come from that critical approach of of Jekyll, certainly his full statement of the case, that actually it's not necessarily a satisfactory ending. Jekyll goes, spends a long time trying to sort of convince us that, you know, that he lost control. But actually, he he also was the one who instigated all of the bad things as well. And I think he was in more control over what Hyde was doing than maybe he has admitted um, throughout the rest of the novel. Now, here are the, the chapter summaries. I won't go through them all because, to be honest with you, these are things that I would suggest you should be doing uh, in your own time. But you've got the three first chapters, the story of the door, where we are met, where we meet Utterson. We also hear about Hyde and we have the story of the girl who's been trampled. Search for Hyde is when Utterson um, is concerned about Jekyll's will. He goes to see his friend Lanyon and then becomes quite obsessive about going to see Mr. Hyde, who's entering into the same door as described in the first chapter. Chapter three, we have De Dr. Jekyll's quite at ease. So we're introduced finally to our, our character of Dr. Jekyll, who, um, he, who Utterson speaks to at a dinner party about the character of Hyde. And Jekyll laughs off his worries. Jekyll does not take his worries seriously. Chapter four, chapter five, chapter six here. We begin with the Carew murder case. So this is the, um, the murder of um, who we later find out to be quite an old MP, um, described as being quite a beautiful man. Um, we then have the incident of the letter where Utterson goes to Jekyll's house and finds him looking deadly sick. So clearly there's something, um, there's a significant change in the way that Jekyll has is being described. And we, we have further conversations about Hyde um, and Jekyll gives um, Utterson a letter um, and says he won't be back. He's going to disappear. Um, and Utterson believes that letter has been forged by Jekyll to cover for Hyde, another red herring if you like. Chapter six, we hear that Hyde has disappeared and, and Jekyll actually comes back. He's more happy, he's sociable, but then very quickly he goes down again. And we have um, eventually the, the death of Dr. Lanyon with further letters that are given to him. And we, we get these sort of hints that there's been something that he won't say or can't say um, about why he's murdered. So we, we, we're being, information is being withheld from us um, at that stage in the novel. The final couple of chapters, we've got Incident in the Window, very, very short chapter where Utterson and Enfield are taking a stroll again. They see Jekyll, they see something happen and they absolutely become um, fearful and, and run away essentially from, from that scene. Chapter eight arguably is the last sort of, if you like, um, 
chapter that, that progresses the narrative in a kind of chronological way. We have um, Paul goes to see Utterson, um, he gets brought to Jekyll's house, and they eventually break into um, Jekyll's um, chamber where they believe Hyde is about to murder him and they can't find him at all as in they can't find Jekyll but they find the body of, of the just died Hyde and um, there is a, a letter another letter that Utterson has been given which contains the following two chapters for Dr Langman's narrative in the, the case of um, uh, Henry Jekyll's full statement of the case. Now these two not these two chapters here change the the um, the speaker. We have a different narrator here. We actually hear directly from the words of Dr. Lanyon, and it talks about the 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 request that Jekyll asks him to do, where essentially he is manipulated into watching Hyde turn from Hyde into Jekyll, which essentially causes Lanyon's death. And then in the final chapter, we have yet another new speaker, another new narrator. This time it's Jekyll. And this is where Jekyll gives us the full backstory. Um, and it's, he sort of shows how he was experimenting with, with, um, with changing in his personality. And eventually um, he became addicted to changing into Hyde, who took over and destroyed him. So those are the very quick um, summaries of the chapters. And again, you're very welcome to kind of pause here um, or, or revisit these at a later stage if you want to. Now here are a series of key terms that I'd encourage you to, to become familiar with. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say you have to mention every single one within a response, but I would say these are a really, really good starting point for the sorts of words that I would expect to see in a, in a top mark um, essay. They both link to some of the themes, but also some of the um, areas of, of kind of the, the chapter, um, the writing style of this novel. Things like Darwinism, symbolism, juxtaposition, the subconscious, those kinds of words there that I would expect to see. So feel free to pause this page or take a screenshot of it. Now, the themes of this novel. There are lots of themes that are found within this novel, but these I'd suggest are some of the more um, prevalent ones here. And I, I've linked, I'm going to show you some quotations that I would suggest that you consider thinking about using for, for your revision. These aren't necessarily the only quotations that link to them um, and actually one thing that I would suggest you do now is you pause this video and you start to, to think about what those individual words mean what do they suggest you know for example this I concealed my pleasure this idea that actually he's keeping something private this idea of repression keeping hold of something for violence something that hails down a storm of blows think about this word hailing um, you know associated with sort of um, you know, snowy, cold weather, those sorts of things. Um, I put this one here. This was an interesting one to do with lies and deceit. That actually, it's really only on the second time of reading this novel that you realise how many times the character of Jekyll has lied to Utterson, and he does. He lies a lot. So this this moment here refers to when Jekyll, uh, sorry, excuse me, where Hyde meets Utterson for the first time, and Utterson talks about them having common friends, and he says, J Hyde says, I do not think he would have lied. And I put it here to highlight that actually that. With Hyde, actually, he tells the truth to, to Utterson, whereas in Jekyll's form, he often lies or he keeps things private from him. I remember at the beginning of the novel, um, Stevenson makes a real point of demonstrating that Utterson is somebody to be trusted. Utterson is somebody who we can rely upon to, to help us out. He is the last reputable acquaintance of downgoing men. And yet Jekyll, knowing that, and we've got to assume he does know that, being one of his oldest friends, one of his old cronies, as said, um, he chooses not to involve Utterson. The question I would pose to you is why? Why doesn't he involve Utterson? If he really wanted to be rid of um, of Hyde, you know, why not? Why not let him involved? My view is that he doesn't want Utterson to be involved because, you know, Utterson will make him better. He'll make him, it'll stop him from getting involved in those kinds of um, sinful behaviour. And that, I think, if you look back to that final chapter of The Full State of Jekyll, you know, as much as Jekyll kind of absolves his responsibility and claims it wasn't him, actually, the reality, it, it, he chooses to be, to place himself in a, in a situation um, which puts him in, in danger. Um, lots of references to um, duality, um, good versus evil or, or other things like that. 
so you know you, you know this idea of being at war with one another the good and the evil um another a good quotation you could think about is man is not truly one but truly two that's something important to say appearance and identity is a really important one to think about you know that there's something wrong with his appearance you know why is it that stevenson makes such a point of describing how people feel about excuse me how they feel about Hyde but actually does not in any way give us really any, anything tangible to describe and often I think it's to do with the fact that Hyde is is a reflection of the the person who's looking at him so if you like there is no face of Hyde because he projects onto somebody else um, what they think it's their own kind of um, sinful behavior that he literally reflects back at them so there's lots of quotations here to think about and, and if nothing else these would be a good place to start now remember with your exam you don't have to go into the exam with hundreds and hundreds of quotations i don't think it's a useful use of your time either what i would rather you think about is more more about what these themes um what stevenson is saying about these themes and how they appear at different moments during the novel and perhaps it might be worth considering about a first time reading of this novel versus a second time we actually start to think differently about it. Now, once again, I'm not going to go through every single uh, uh, piece of information here. There's a lot here. There's a lot of words to think about. And these, again, are just starting points for you to think about in terms of formulating your interpretation. I've mentioned quite a few times the exam and about how to achieve those high marks. And I think part of the way of getting there is about making sure that you have a very clear interpretation that doesn't have to be shared by your teacher. It doesn't have to be shared by your peers, but provided it links and makes sense within the novel, then you'll be on to, a, a, I think, a bit of a winner here. Um, we've got this idea I've mentioned before about he subconsciously reminds those who he encounters of their distant evolutionary inheritance. So perhaps, in other words, their own kind of progression to becoming more civilized, which may Maybe we want to forget. Victorians thought that scientific research should subordinate to moral values. In other words, mo morals were more important than science, perhaps. Um, an idea about how Jekyll is torn between his Christian faith and his scientific mind. And if you look at throughout the novel, there, there really is that sense that actually he is, he wants to be both. He wants to be seen as quite a rep reputable Christian man. And at the same time, he also has this desire to explore the kind of uh, avenues of science as well. Um, we've got one sign of Hyde's weakness is the defacing of Dr. Jekyll's uh, religious work. You know, we've got actually that, um, you know, he, he wants to uh, upset uh, Jekyll. Um, he, he wants to um, highlight him and show his link within, within Satan and, and the devil. And that is often made reference to within the, um, within the novel. Um, we've got this idea that Hyde's behaviour intensifies the classic behaviour of deepening addiction. So if you think about actually that what happens is Jekyll becomes addicted to Hyde um, more so than anything else. He becomes addicted to, to this way of feeling. He becomes addicted to um, exploring how um, Hyde makes him feel. So it's not that actually Hyde, Jekyll himself is a moralistic person because he wants to explore these kind of areas of his darker side and does it anyway, despite the fact that he... Um, knows that it's wrong and stevenson's story now this is an interesting one at the bottom stevenson's story denies women as a social force or a source of authority so actually you could argue this novel is a very patriarchal novel it certainly marginalizes the women's voice within the novel at all and perhaps it's maybe stevenson highlighting the the issues with with men and and masculine uh, identity and the pressures perhaps of the victorian society upon um upon uh, upon men basically so there's other things in here that I've not mentioned, but certainly I would really encourage you to, to, to make a note of them and consider what you think about them too. No matter what comes up on your exam, the character of Hyde is absolutely going to be a character that you're going to need to be talking about. So therefore, as part of your revision, um, you need to be absolutely nailing what you can say about this character and really understand and grapple with what it is that Stevenson is talking about and the way he presents this character. Now, the first thing to say, and it's really crucial to get this, that there is no separate character of Hyde. Hyde is, if you like, represents the evil side of Jekyll's brain. So it's better to sort of see them as kind of two sides solely of the same body, a good side and a bad side. All right. And it's, it's that, those desires and characters that drive Jekyll to destruction and actually lead him to 
essentially his own death really now he's responsible for all the main plot points all the inciting actions that occur, occur within this this novel including the trumping of the girl the murder of the crew the death of lanyon and ultimately the destruction of jekyll but absolutely it is jekyll who is in charge to for the most part with um with, within this novel I think one of the most obvious things to say about the character of Hyde is his name. It represents that desire to hide something. And there is a kind of slight dry bit of humour where Utterson says, well, if I'm Mr Hyde, I shall be seen. If he is Hyde, I shall be seen. You know, so there is this sort of sense of game that's, that Utterson creates and it sort of reflects his own sort of obsession with, um, with the character of Hyde. But he definitely represents pure evil. And the thing to, to sort of think about is that actually Jekyll doesn't find Hyde repulsive. It, Jekyll and Utterson, neither of them find him particularly repulsive. In fact, you know, he, he welcomes, Jekyll welcomes the character of Hyde. Then what you could talk about in your essay uh, by just focusing on that word welcome, you could, you could compare him to almost every other character um, within the novel. He represents fear and deep loathing in people and the desire to kill. And you'll see earlier about the way that women were as wild as harpies. And it's what he does to other people. So just by looking at the character of Hyde, your inner desires of violence and cruelty come out really, really clearly. And this is the idea that actually Victorians sort of firstly believed that for the most part to be a respectable person you need you shouldn't have had those kind of feelings at all but actually it also links to this theme of in the victorian society people believe that your appearance reflected your personality so actually the way that you looked could determine that and there was actually quite a lot of what we now have debunked as sort of pseudoscience but there are a lot of victorian people who genuinely believe that the shape of your face, the shape of your nose, the slope of your cheeks, all of those sorts of things could in some way denote the type of person you were. Um, we, we don't believe that so much anymore, um, but definitely it was the, the, the a, a belief in, this, in the Victorian era that they felt that way. Um, you should obviously, one of the things you'll, you'll almost certainly have um, picked up on is the fact that he is shorter um, and wears the clothes of Jekyll, but they, they hang off his body. And you could talk about the fact that actually he's like dwarfish and it's almost like he has gone backwards in terms of his development as a, as a, as a being, if you like, that he is, he reflects the sort of unevolved um, parts of our kind of personality so despite the fact that i've said that there isn't two different people his body does change and you need to think about perhaps what that reflects um about victorian society as well as um the the novel progresses he becomes more and more violent now certainly the the, the event in the first chapter the trumping of the girl is is a violent event but it it's only violent because of the way that, that Hyde reacts. He tramples calmly over this girl. He doesn't take into consideration her feelings. You know, to, to walk over somebody is an accident, but if he wants knowing, you do something about it, don't you? But Hyde doesn't, you know, Hyde doesn't make any of those changes. He murders Carew for no reason, although I would say that you need to think very carefully about the character of, of Carew and think very carefully about that moment in the text about why those two are having a conversation. Now, you could easily have a, a good interpretation about the fact that it's an innocent person meeting an evil person. So there's that interpretation. But personally, I think there's a little bit deeper than that, that actually that Carew possibly doesn't reflect um, or, or reflect sorry sorry the Victorian kind of hypocrisy of, of character and uh, behavior and actually we don't really investigate Carew's misdemeanors because he's a nice guy he looks he looks the part Hyde doesn't and actually you'll see throughout the novel there are lots of characters who sort of somewhat hint or confess to them getting involved in sinful behavior but it's not really ever talked about because there it's them you know Enfield is coming back from the end of the world well that's not investigated because it, you know people don't want to get involved in other people's business the character of Jekyll or the other side of that personality firstly he's a medical doctor more interested in chemistry than surgery and, and you'll have, there's a couple of occasions throughout the novel where we hear about the surgeon who owned the house um, that Jekyll lives in and he certainly he reflects that that alteration that the emphasis into the chemical side of science as well and he carries out experiments that ultimately lead him to his alter ego now remember in the final chapter Jekyll talks about how 
others will follow. That that modal verb of certainty, will, you know, indicates that actually Jekyll is going to be the first of a long line of people who are able to explore what goes on inside of our brain. Our job as, as students of literature is to decide whether that is morally right or morally wrong. And it's that sort of idea of, of why he, he got on the wrong side of Lanyon, that it was too fanciful for him. You know, he was wrong in the mind. It was that wrong approach to science. So this idea of science, often we think about is to do with truth. But actually, there is a moral element towards science. You know, where do we put our time and effort and attention? Is it right to um, research certain conditions or, or is that just the way that life has to be? So, you know, th those debates are still relevant um, to today's society. And Lanyon certainly represents the people who would believe that the science, you know, has kind of boundaries, that science needs to kind of almost like know its place. Um, and that's kind of like the idea that that scientific uh, interest was kind of linked to this sort of supernatural, um, the, the transcendental, the mystic, the kind of actually the ways in which we can breach that idea of science and moving away from, from religion, if you like, as well. Um, we've got that throughout the, the whole novel that as the novel continues and certainly when we get into his full statement of case, you know, he, he reveals that he's tormented by the behaviour of Hyde and that actually, you know, that the, the nice sort of descriptions about him, you know, the smile was struck out of his face, the, the, the uh, quotation from um, Incident at the Window, you know, that verb struck, that violent verb sound struck was, was taken, um, that smile was taken away from him as well. But the thing is with Jekyll, he wants to hold his head high. He is fond of the respect that people give him. So he wants his good reputation. He wants to be seen to be um, respected in that regard. Um, and actually, you know, it, you know to, to quote the idiom, you know, he wants his cake and eat it. He wants the, the best of the good bits and the best of the bad bits and, and to live with them you know, equally, which we know in our society, you can't really do that if, you know, we don't we don't really allow that to take place. One of the important motifs within this novel is the theme of secrets and this idea of um, secrets within secrets within secrets. And we get a, a whole series of enigmas and mysteries, official documents that don't, aren't quite fully trusted. If you look at the will that's made right at the beginning of the novel, Utterson is not involved in it. He, he's looking after it, but he's not involved in it. So it's the reasons why those um, wheels are made in the first place we get constant repetition of fog um, this idea that actually fog clouds our judgment and and a really key part is this idea of, of envelopes that envelopes contain secrets that we have letters that are often handed to people that people that characters in the novel don't want to um, to to open for fear of what they might contain. So this this metaphor of of secrets to for hidden identities or stories within stories are, are a regular um, thing that occur within this novel as well. So something to again to help with your with your revision. I would suggest right now you pause this page and you kind of read each one of the boxes so you've got a clear idea of the kind of different layers of um, secrets that are found within this novel. Now we're coming towards the end of our time together today and I just wanted to go through what your exam will look like. You are going to be given an extract. OK, so it will be about the same length of what's in front of you here. And there are some things that I would suggest you, you consider. Firstly, you'll be told or given a kind of two or three sentences about when in the novel it occurs and what is occurring within it. The first thing you should be thinking of, right, is the chapter that, that it comes from. You know, this is chapter eight. OK, there's only 10 chapters. So this occurs late in the, the novel. Um, we've got here Jekyll's servant. Uh, Poole is talking to Utterson. So we haven't yet got to the concluding part of the novel things are being kept with from us and then you then need to think about the question and notice I'm not getting you to think about the extract yet but I'm getting I want you to think about the question explore how Stevenson presents Mr Hyde as inhuman and disturbing member of society every single sentence you write has got to be in some way linked to those key words and it's those key words that I think are going to be the key to your success when it comes to the exam and you need to firstly think about how the, the key words are present in the extract, in this extract, but then importantly, in the novel as a whole. 
You're going to be assessed on three assessment objectives for this exam. Your first one is to read and understand and respond to the text. So in other words, you need to know this text really well, but you need to have informed personal response. That means that you have your own individual way of approaching this text. You need to include quotations to illustrate whatever interpretation you have. So you need to be integrating your quotations here. But the nice part of this exam is the fact that you're given an extract. The examiners will want you to get your quotations primarily primarily from the extract that you're given here. AO2 is getting you to think about the way that language is used. So for example, let's say, you know, this, uh, this phrase here, cry out like a rat. So really focused exploration of, of the individual words and phrases. Um, getting you to think about the form. So this is a Gothic novel or a crime novel. Um, so thinking about the way in which those sorts of conventions are used. And then finally, the way that structure is used. So how Stevenson has organized this novel. What order has he given the events? Has he withheld something from us? Has he deliberately given us a red herring? You know, so making sure you're really clear about um, about the structure of, of novel. And most importantly, with all of these, is how does it create effects? What effect does it create on us? What do how do we respond? Now the final one is AO3, and this is what I mentioned earlier about the context of the novel. So this is understanding the big ideas of the text. So what is Stevenson saying about the novel? What is Stevenson saying about Victorian society? What lessons should we learn? And you might even think about, do different types of audiences respond differently to, to this text? So for example, a Victorian audience might read this in a very different way to the way that a modern audience might read. Both of those different sort of approaches or interpretations are really important as well. Now, once again, here's another slide that I would encourage you to pause and use to kind of as part of your revision. But these are some of the key words that have come up in the past as well. So here are all the papers we currently have available to us that might help you with your revision. So thinking carefully about how mystery, fear or frightening outsiders or the effects of ambition or sympathy or mystery and tension is created. What I would encourage you to do is find an appropriate extract. We can always find extracts for you if you want to and have a go at writing it and handing it to your teachers. The final two slides again I would suggest that you have a look at and here are some ways in which you can kind of chart different themes across the whole novel or different characters as well. So you've got say duality, that how it that links to Hyde and Jekyll and Utterson. Um, you've got the idea of silence and secrecy. Some of the themes that I've spoken about before. So again I've put them here both this one and the next slide to help with your kind of uh, revision interpretation of the, the text. So here's the final slide um, that I wanted to go through with you today. Um, again, pause this one and make your own notes. Learn these quotations as best as you can. And more, more importantly, be able to say something you know, interesting about them to help you with, with your exams. I wish you all the very best. And if there's anything that, that we can do as a school to help you get ready, then you're ready to ask. We will do what we can. We're here to help you. If you want some help with your revision, then please let us know. And um, you know, we'll help you out as, as in any way that we think will be the best for you. The most important thing is you need to know the text. And I always say to the classes that I teach is, would you rather I spend time with you in lessons going through the chapters and what happens in each chapters or going through the text in detail and helping you with your analysis. And I personally think uh, we're more valuable to you if you do your bit of understanding the, the, the text like the back of your hand, it enables us then to be valuable for you to be able to, to get you, um, you know, really thinking critically and developing your interpretations as well. I really hope you found this video useful. Um, if you want any more videos, then please let uh, myself know and we'll do what we can uh, in the future. But best of luck and thank you for listening to, the, uh, to this video. Thank you.